When the army vacates Middle Head, it leaves behind some of Australia's most valuable real estate. Who this land belongs to and what should be done with it is challenging all levels of government. If you've got a once in a millennium opportunity, you don't hesitate. You just seize the land. You seize the hour. You grab the land for future generations. Mr Carr hasn't got the money. He can't do the remedial work. We're the only people who can do the remedial work. We're mad if we're not protecting for public access. Every vantage point around our harbour, and to think of defence land which offers that sort of grand view, that, that beautiful panorama of, of, of shimmering water and, and gum trees and the entrance to our, our lovely harbour being sold to people who can afford big pl plots of property, I mean, that's an obscenity. If we own the land, we just own the land. I mean, if he's going to be silly about it. The government has taken a number of decisions to relocate defence installations previously on the foreshores of Sydney Harbour. And as a consequence of that, has devised a long-term plan uh, to return that vacated land to the people of Australia. In September 1998, Prime Minister John Howard announced that $96 million from the Federation Fund would be used to relocate defence forces and decontaminate some areas of defence lands on Sydney Harbour. He said that in 10 years, this land would become part of Sydney Harbour National Park. But a lack of funding for rehabilitation, management and planning still leaves the way open for commercial activities and redevelopment of these valuable sites. The struggle to keep harbour foreshore land in public hands has become a passion for citizens groups and conservationists. This film records the last year of that struggle. It also records how other foreshore land continues to be alienated or threatened by private development and that the battle for Sydney Harbour is far from over. The first fleet came in through the heads and the first thing they would have seen was Middlehead and George's huts. My association goes back to August of 1966 when um, I joined the commando unit up there, commando regiment, and I spent three years as a member of one commando. So I went through my recruit training, through to getting my Green Beret and uh, advanced training after that. It's probably one of the most beautiful parts of Sydney. The views are spectacular. The remnant bushland that's still there is quite fantastic, uh, with a lot of native species. And the whole place has a fabulous feel about it. It's incredibly important land. It's, it's a fantastic group of um, defence sites that were there to defend Sydney in, in the days when it's a totally different technology. They've survived, and now they're an incredible scenic, recreational, potentially recreational value, heritage value, a whole load of different factors relate to them. It was the first significant encounter that Europeans had with Aboriginals uh, when uh, they came to Sydney. Uh, Captain Hunter, on the 29th of January 1788, was commissioned to uh, sail around the harbour. And as he was sailing around Middle Head, he encountered a group of Aborigines on the headland. They came down to the beach and they met. And the sailors came ashore and there was a spontaneous greeting and the Aborigines and the sailors linked arms and danced, danced on the beach. Now, can you imagine that? And uh, what, it's something that we should uh, be very mindful of uh, in this time of the reconciliation movement, that uh, here we have an example of the two cultures coming together and, and enjoying the moment. And uh, we need to continue uh, that memory. What I want to point out though is the bureaucrats are saying that this land is going to be made into a federal trust. But the big question mark is do they still want to proceed and sell 120 sites uh, on, on, where exactly, you see that position down there where, where, the, where the commando headquarters is. That's where they want to put the 120 sites and also follow it round where the existing roads are. It's, it's just utter stupidity. I mean, it really belongs to the people, not only of Mossman or of Sydney, but the nation as a whole. And yet there are still defence bureaucrats believe it's their land. It's not their land at all, it's our land. 
we own the land, will you stay on the land? But I really have to say, you can get very emotional about all this if you don't know what's going on. But as I said, these plans here have been very carefully done. They can probably be improved a little more. Defence prepared, have prepared a number of plans. One would have hoped they might have shown the community some of these plans, but they've kept them back as secret plans. Why? Why? They don't trust the community. We would block development on those sites. They wouldn't get a development approval. And with that warning, I don't think any developer is going to snap them up at a Commonwealth auction. It's a miracle that land hasn't already been built on, of course. Uh, fortunately, that has been saved by the Defence Forces. So that land, of course, now it has been saved for this long, should never be built on now. So we do hope that uh, Bob Carr will be able to maintain that promise after March 99, you know. I think something should be done. And obviously there's economics associated with whatever gets done. And if that really means a, a number of houses have to get up and be put in that direction, I don't see any major harm in that as long as it's done uh, according to the rules and uh, tastefully. I don't think that we should be turning around and trying to make the whole thing into National Park. Um, no, that gives the people who love National Parks what they want, but it really le leaves out all of the other people. I see nothing wrong with a certain amount of housing blocks being created along uh, Middlehead Road there. And if the money's from the sale, of those housing lots can go towards uh, provision of a trust which will maintain uh, the area uh, and, and, and allow for the replanting of bushland and so on and the maintenance of the area, then I believe that's a very appropriate uh, course of action to follow. I'm certainly against any sort of housing that would be visible from the harbour on the ridge line um, and that sort of thing. Well, Mossman Council has got a policy of limited development of housing. Those who play by the sword will die by the sword. It must have been about a year ago now, there were, I was rung up by a marketing company to, to, and asked could I come to a special survey. And when I got there, it was sort of, you know, tea and sandwiches and everything. And we were asked uh, various ways that, that Middlehead could be uh, developed, I guess, for want of a better word. And uh, it, we were asked, you know, did we want 300 houses or 500 houses or 120 houses? And uh, then there was talk about a, a, a swimming, a big swimming uh, area, like an, an uh, indoor one, you know. And um, I remember at the end of all this, I sort of said very quietly to the lady who was running it, what, what about the no houses option? Why don't we just leave it as, as green space? Wouldn't that be wonderful? And they were, she was absolutely outraged that I'd even asked, especially that I'd asked in front of other people. And she said, oh, no, you couldn't possibly have that. She said it would all fall to pieces and there'd be nothing to pay for the infrastructure. And then I just sort of sat back and I thought, well, geez, it's been there millions of years, you know, and it hasn't fallen to bits now. Why would it, why would it fall to bits after this if, no, if a whole lot of money wasn't spent on it? They hadn't told us the extent of the development up there. Uh, all the way along we were told that the ridgelands were going to be regenerated, revegetated, uh, there was going to be um, uh, no housing that was in view of the harbour. In fact, the housing would not be able to view the harbour, so any housing was going to be secluded. We didn't want the housing, but that's what we're told. When we had a look at the plans, the plans clearly showed, very clearly showed, that housing was going to be sitting right on the ridgeline, that even a single-storey house could see the harbour. When I was on council, there was a briefing by uh, a developer who was working on behalf of the Defence Department. And prior to any of this being discussed, and prior to any decisions even being made by the council, by the, by the aldermen and the councillors, prior to any discussion or decision, we were given an information evening which consisted of a developer coming in and showing all these lovely pictures of what sort of housing they would put there. And I was just quietly stunned because, I mean, the pictures were of these very humble little homes with these magnificent sandstone rocky outcrops with all these trees everywhere. And I thought, yes, where exactly in Sydney does development really end looking like that? Normally the trees would be removed or the, certainly the rocks would be excavated for a swimming pool and so on. But I think the, the alarming thing was that all those plans had been drawn up. We had been hoodwinked through the whole process. Their agenda was very clear, it turns out. 
and that was to develop Crown land so that they could finance their coffers. In other words, they could fund the movement of troops from the Sydney area to wherever they're going, to the north of Queensland. Uh, a few months ago, um, we took a tour, uh, a tour of the site with the most senior level defence bureaucrat. And um, at the end of the tour, defence pulled out a map I'd never seen. This is the very first map we'd seen with the ridgeline. So we took the map and we compared it and we found errors in the map. We found that defence had, um, I believe, moved the ridgeline. The ridgeline was not where the ridgeline should have been. In fact, the ridgelines appeared to be drawn around the housing development. Um, we found other inconsistencies that actually put buildings back that were supposed to be taken away. Buildings right on the foreshore, non-heritage buildings had been put back. There were more houses in certain areas and we also um, turned up the fact that um, um, the amount of land to be sold had been increased by about 20 percent. The deal proposed by the Defence Department was that in return for Mossman Council permitting the sale of 120 new housing lots, Canberra would fund a $10 million multi-purpose leisure centre, all on public land. The multi-purpose leisure centre, that was going to be paid for by the Defence Department in return for the sale of some 120 blocks of land. Do you consider that some kind of trade-off there? Well, it certainly sounds like it, doesn't it? Is there a connection between the leisure centre and the sale of the land? Absolutely. No, <laughs> there have to be a dollar for dollar uh, association with them. I mean, this is part of the whole arrangement. I'd be in favour of a community recreational facility up there, uh, incorporating a, a, an aquatic facility, um, a small number of indoor courts, no more than two, uh, you know, a gymnasium, servicing local community needs. Uh, bearing in mind that such a facility would not occupy more than one to two percent of the total area of the land up there. Furthermore, the the site could the, the facility could be positioned in such a in such a way that it would not be visible from the harbour, which would be a prerequisite as far as I'm concerned. I don't think we need a multi-purpose leisure centre at George's Heights. The area that has been specified for the multi-purpose leisure centre the area where um, the now derelict resupply tanks are would make a perfect playing field and that's what it should be. They're talking about a 50 metre swimming pool. A 50 metre pool costs a million dollars a year to heat. Now, I don't think any of them understand that, but it's true. Having regard to the nature of the environment that we've got here, I can't quite see the justification for having a, a leisure centre, um, particularly if it involves a pool when you're on the water side. I think there's quite enough leisure of different sorts in Mossman. We can always go to North Sydney Pool and things like that. There's lots around. Wouldn't you people like to have a, a big swimming pool in the Mossman area? We have one. Look at it. <laughs> <laughs> if it hadn't been for our groups, um, you'd get this additional massive development on the harbour. And let me point out, the one big difference between the uh, defence land on Sydney Harbour and things like the toaster and all of the other development that's being proposed is none of the stuff on defence land has actually happened. There's no development applications, there are no pro specific proposal, nothing's been built. So it's as if you could go back in time before the toaster was built and the toaster being the apartment building next to the opera house and stop it and that's what we have the chance to do. What the government has to understand is that you can't flog off the last remaining significant publicly owned sites around Sydney Harbour to private developers. Those days have gone. People love this harbour. You talk to anybody, visitors, people who live in Sydney, people who just come from anywhere in Australia to Sydney, they love it. And any government who wants to, in a sense, to, to rape and rake over Sydney Harbour does so at its own cost. Elsewhere around the harbour, residents are quietly regenerating areas of bushland. A valuable asset 
they say, endangered by creeping development. Well, my view of Sydney Harbour is the fingers of blue and green. The green of the bush, the blue of the inlets of the waterways. And I think it's one of the most evocative descriptions and views of Sydney Harbour that you could possibly have. And I think it's these lovely undeveloped areas, the areas that have survived development to date, that are the real treasures of Sydney Harbour. They're the jewels in the crown. There is no other single issue that so many people in the community are involved in as the conservation of urban bushland. It arouses tremendous passion and there's people that I know who've been working to protect urban bushland for 30 years and they're unremitting in their desire uh, to see this bushland conserved. And it's, it's a very moving experience and it's particularly peculiar to Sydney. Sydney's bushland is so unique. The bushland around the foreshores is Hawkesbury sandstone vegetation mostly. It's restricted just to the Sydney region, most of it. And I think most members of the community see this as something that should be kept for future generations. The bushland in a city actually contributes benefits that could be deemed to be public health benefits and ecosystem benefits because the trees filter the air, the, the root systems are part of the hydrological system so they filter the water. The litter on the floor of the bushland slows down the runoff and that's all part of the filtering system. The contribution to greenhouse gases is also important. Well, today we're doing some follow-up on this site. We actually haven't been to this spot for quite a while. Um, it used to be covered with lantana, privet, and some very nasty vines like anredera and rumex. You've got a couple of little ones coming back here. And what's been happening since we worked here, we've got a lot of coachwoods, little coachwoods, coming up all over the place. This is one here. We've got smilax, so we're getting quite good regeneration. The main problem here is some wandering dew. This is called the Valley of the Water Dragon and we're eight kilometres from the GPO in Sydney and we could be a million miles from anywhere, as you can see. It's just paradise. Bushland is the responsibility of councils to maintain and it does depend a little bit who owns it and who pays for it. Sometimes it's Crown land, sometimes it's owned by a council, uh, sometimes it's under their care, control and management, but basically they're the ones who've got to pay for it and look after it. And until recently, bushland hasn't been valued so highly. It's only in the last 15 to 20 years that pe people have been really fighting for, for bushland. So people want more, but it has to fit in with all of the other priorities. It is very important that it's done because the longer you leave it, the longer it's going to cost in the long term. And in the long term, we're not going to be able to afford to leave it. Pressures on ur urban bushland are coming from all directions. They're coming from local councils that are trying to attract commercial development, that are wanting develop to develop housing estates. They come from the private sector who want to develop housing estates, uh, from individuals who want to extend the buildings or the facilities on their land and they're coming from government which uh, often will support any venture that promotes economic development. The preservation of bushland is now a key issue in the municipality of Willoughby, where the council is under pressure to relax its long-standing foreshore building line to permit private development closer to the waterfront. The foreshore building line applies to private land. It's a planning control used by a large number of councils, not only in Sydney but across the state, and it applies to areas near a waterway. Now those waterways can be a bay, a river, a harbour, a lake, a lagoon or a creek. So you could even have a foreshore building line in inland New South Wales. They are particularly important in Sydney of course because we've got such marvellous waterways. They function just like a building setback, uh, but instead of relating to the road or the side boundaries, they relate to the waterway. And what they do is to stop development below them, generally of a dwelling or a house, 
but it may include other things as well. The Forshaw Building Line Control is not about your typical small suburban backyard. You're talking about very old subdivisions where people have very, very deep backyards, in some cases hundreds of metres. What we're talking about in private properties is actual incremental, a small change that happens sometimes gradually, sometimes with a bit more of a rush. And you almost don't know what you've lost until you look at a photograph ten years ago and you see gradually people have built on here, they've built an addition to their house there, trees have come down there, a big new house has gone there, two little houses have come down and one big one's replaced, a group of garages have happened there. So it's all this uh, summation of a small number of changes which create the problem that we've got. How big is your block of land? It's uh, slightly under 4,000 square metres, which is a little bit under an acre. It's probably eight times the size of the average block in Castle Craig. The foreshore building line is right against our house. It is approximately 18 metres from the street on a block that's almost 200 metres long. In other words, over 90% of our land is alienated from the uses that we paid for when we purchased the property. When property owners successfully challenge Willoughby's environmental plan, the council appeals and retains the right to set the foreshore building line. The court makes no judgment about the position of the line, so the council commissions an independent review to define where it ought to be. Believing that this review may affect the value of their properties, some residents lobby the council for the right to develop their land closer to the harbour shore. We have never objected to the imposition of a fair foreshore building line. However, the issue is one of how do you do it? What is a fair way of doing it? Is it fair to take 90% of one person's property and then several houses down take 10%? We think it's not because the topography and the natural features and the natural values that we're trying to protect vary from site to site, we should expect that the line will affect different pieces of, line, of land to, to a different degree. So whilst it may be unfair in terms of proportionality, um, it's certainly justifiable in terms of the criteria that have been established and that have been endorsed through the process of community consultation and independent expert advice. In spite of excellent support from five councillors, the majority of councillors voted to move the line in a number of places, and these are the most significant locations. By and large, they were happy to go with the consultant's report, but it's in the really significant places they decided to move the line. There is a proposal to move it down so we only lose 70%. I would say that even 70% is that unreasonable, particularly as it's not necessary. It achieves no conservation purpose whatever. What it does do, however, is devalue our property. A foreshore building line, when it's moved closer to the water, can allow, depending on the situation, it can allow additional houses, which may include rows of houses, not just isolated houses. It will include loss of trees, removal of the canopy, opening up of that whole bushland vista. So this lovely, almost unchanged bushland view will disappear and it'll become like much more built up areas around earlier developed parts of the harbour. I don't know what will happen to the wildlife. I mean, gradually they'll be pushed out and out. Once you cut their corridors, they become isolated into places where they can't move. They try and move across roads in some cases, depending on the kind of wildlife we're talking about. Um, or they've got to fight within smaller territories against, you know, a pop an existing population. This is a very special area for wildlife because only two years ago a quoll was sighted uh, around Sugarloaf Bay. Now that is a very rare and very special event. We have echidnas here, we have powerful owls which are on the threatened species list. We have red crowned toadlets, tiny little creatures. But ecologically it is an important area and it's important because of its size and continuity. Uh, if we give in at this point the, pre the precedent will be there for any other areas of Sydney and whilst I think this is the, the most beautiful bit of Sydney Harbour, there are undoubtedly other parts of, of Sydney um, where local councils will be influenced by the experience here. 
Well, I haven't given up hope. Um, I know that a lot of people will be fighting very hard to protect it, to prevent the council's changes coming to, to pass. And in the end, it's going to be in the hands of the minister. It is, uh, what well, I tend to believe, uh, a case of uh, democracy in action to the best of our ability. Look, at the end of the day, someone's not going to be happy with this. Across the water at North Head, another conflict is looming over Sydney's quarantine station, now being primed for commercial development. The developers' plans have not been released, nor has the public been consulted. Quarantine is important because of its long history, 150 years it's been established. Uh, it's a gateway to many immigrants that came into Australia. Not all of them, of course, but many, those who came off the ships that, uh, where there were smallpox and infectious diseases. And they were forced to remain there for months on end. So the, there's, there's dozens of, of uh, immigrants went through there, dozens of cultures. It was a fastidious um, example of uh, disease control of the 19th century. It's probably one of the most unspoilt historical sites in Australia. It's been literally quarantined until uh, 1970s, and it's now, of course, operated by the state government through the national parks. In a sense, it's kind of strange that the national parks have come to inherit it, because we always associated them with, with park lands and wildlife, but they're also now the custodians of these heritage sites. Chairs all the way along it, so after dinner... National parks are running reasonably successfully at the moment, in that they're allowing tour groups in, they have conferences there and so on, but it's low key. And many people would argue, well, we'd rather have it stay that way. In 1881, there was a huge smallpox epidemic that actually got into Sydney. And um, people were brought from their homes and brought to the quarantine station to keep the disease from spreading through Sydney. And um, these people National parks are running that site now for 20 years or so, and I think they've managed it very well. But they are under-resourced, and of course the government's playing the usual trick, which is to under-resource the agency so that they're in a sense forced to outsource and, and go out to contract. We don't have the resources or the available availability of resources to actually be able to manage the entire site and conserve the entire site in, in the way that it should be conserved. Um, yeah, the whole place is actually up for lease at the moment. I don't know if you all realise that, yeah, but um, what they wanted when they started the leasing agreement was for somebody to come in, a commercial venture, to come in and use the buildings as a part of the rest, like to meet the restoration dem demands. And they'd be um, managed by the national parks, but they'd use it as a commercial venture. So that's down to one. They've gone through a very fastidious process of going out for inspections of interest and uh, looking for tenders, but by the very fact that it's been done confidentially means that the community's been locked out of the process. It's now 12 years since this started. Uh, the community don't know what's happening. They don't know the nature of what's likely to be the final outcome. But it means the whole complex will be uh, contracted out to one individual company. There's about 60 or 70 buildings associated with it. There's a, there's a wharf, there's a cemetery, there's historical sites. The, the advantage is uh, money will be invested that there will be perhaps a richer and more complex experience there. The downside is that you are denying access to the public. The public have limited access there at the moment. They can organise ahead to go there, but if it's a private ownership, there'll be a lock on the gate, and it'll only be by arrangement you can go in there. And uh, we don't know what areas will be denied access to. Now, if that happens at quarantine, it could be a disaster. Access to the site will be by guided tour or attending a conference centre or function centre, those sorts of things. So access to the site will always remain controlled. I mean, you can't have just open and free access there because of the, the nature, the sensitive nature of, of the site and, and the fragility of the buildings and many of the, of the artefacts that are around the location. So I, I think that, that public access can be improved and it will be improved, it will be made more accessible than it is now because there will be a greater capacity to manage people on the site than currently exists. A lot of the children that came here lost their parents as well. And if it was a, a government assisted boat, those children would go into an orphanage. If it was a normal boat, an immigrant boat, they'd be left, those children would be left to fend for themselves um, in Sydney. There was one like article that I read of a 10-year-old boy looking after his three siblings because both his parents had died in quarantine. How long is the lease for? 
Well, as I understand, it'll be 20 plus 20 or 25 plus 20. So we're looking at 40, 45 years it'll be alienated. Now, that's, that might be all right if one was confident that times don't change and demands might not be made away beyond what is currently envisaged. But my experience with tendering out uh, public facilities and, and uh, public, uh, uh, well, either public land or pu public infrastructure is that often the lessee uh, will come back and say, I haven't got enough, I want more. Now, there's no guarantee, of course, that, that uh, should there be a tender, that the, the tender at some point in time might not come back to the service and say, look, this isn't working quite the way we anticipated working. We'd like to look at how we might be able to do it better. But we still have a conservation plan, which, which is, is the basis for anything that can be done within the site. So I believe that, that there'll be enough uh, controls within the lease and within the legisl legislation and the conservation plan to ensure that, that nothing is done on that site that, that impairs its uh, conservation and heritage values. There's no doubt that uh, in many cases some of these government agencies are underselling the resource in the sense that they're giving away parts of public land like that which are really community land and the community has been denied access. I'd like to see some clear uh, policies come out of state and federal government that recognises the potential threat to these, these parcels of land. But there's a laissez-faire, uh, deregulated, uh, you know, let the marketplace go for it type attitude amongst governments nowadays that really uh, it's very hard to regulate it. And this is why we're seeing community groups rising up all over the place saying, look, listen to us, we see these areas as precious and uh, we want some role in, in trying to determine their future. Can you give us some sort of an absolute guarantee that we won't see there any buildings of any sort that aren't reconstructed ones in the right style? In other words, no additional modern things? Uh, no, I can't guarantee that. I thought perhaps not. No, 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 I'm not. The conservation plan is, is quite clear on what, what can be built, what new things can be built there. Development by stealth. This is a development of North Head by, by stealth. And I wouldn't like to see any more development go up there at all. OK, well, look, I appreciate <laughs> We have had enough of hearing about commercial inconfidence. We have had enough of hearing of things like Parramatta Park, where the park trustees were in open revolt over the minister's decision to give a 99-year lease to the Parramatta Leeds Club of part of the park. What we have here is another classic recipe. We are facing the commercial interests getting entrenched and steering this from the word go, and the community hasn't, hasn't had the access at the time that it is needed. And we only have to look at, the, at what happened with Sydney Airport. You remember that enormous EIS about the third runway and how the community was told, absolutely, world's best proposal, world's best experts, no problems, and the community went to sleep until the day the bloody thing opened and the roar of planes drew half of Sydney out in outrage. Now, this isn't as big as that, but in terms of its impact upon the local community, it will be significant, and in terms of a precedent or a further potentially bad precedent in the management of the services of state, it is important. Trust is all. This process is heading the wrong way. We were ever, never actually asked the crucial question was, did we want it leased out? That's the question we weren't actually asked. We were told that the government was going to lease it out and we were, uh, the council was asked for input. We were never actually asked and the community has never actually been asked, do we think it's a good idea to lease it out? Unfortunately, the Minister is of the view that it should be leased out. I don't actually believe that all the people who work for national parks, I won't look at them when I say it, believe it should be leased out. I think a lot of those people actually believe it should be in public hands and stay in complete public ownership. And the reason that it should stay in public ownership is because there's no guarantees. There are no guarantees that the Minister will not vary the lease. If Minister Scully can grant owner's consent for a DA for a six-storey hotel on Manly Wharf when a lease specifically says no hotel, then there's no guarantees in life. And that's the problem. However well-intentioned we are now, that's the problem. And if you, if you read your conservation document, there's one crucial line on page, what, David, I handed it to you, and it says, new buildings may be built outside 
the heritage area. And that is the sleeper because while you can't build new buildings in the heritage area that, that Alastair showed us, you can build them on the edge. So just watch it. Well, if we lose the foreshores, I mean, the harbour is Sydney, isn't it? If we lose the foreshores, we're destroying the thing that makes Sydney so beautiful. I mean, the, the foreshores should be kept so that everybody can have a go, everybody can partake of it. Athol Hall in Sydney Harbour National Park has been leased for use as a private function centre. The lease includes not just the building, but about three and a half hectares of adjacent public land. Athol Hall is situated at, at Bradley's Head and it has an interesting history. It goes back to the mid-1800s when it was constructed originally as a hotel and pleasure gardens it was called. It was a, a euphemism I guess for a brothel but uh, that was its, uh, its original use. Um, it, it fell into disrepair over, over many years and uh, the service, National Parks and Wildlife Service, has put considerable effort into trying to maintain the hall because of its heritage values. And in 1995, we entered into a lease over Athol Hall and uh, an area around it. When I was on council, uh, we were approached out of courtesy by the National Parks uh, because they wanted to uh, fix up Athol Hall. It was in bad condition. They wanted to restore it as a heritage building and uh, which sounded very good and of course the inevitable was that they had no money and therefore they wanted to uh, recoup any money put into the building by leasing the hall. My main concern was that the spirit of the discussions held between the National Parks and the General Council Chamber were that the building was to be restored but no open space was to be leased and I'm absolutely horrified to hear that they're now leasing out almost four hectares, which is a major backtracking on the uh, discussions that the council held with the national parks. I can't imagine why all that space is required. I, I still have yet to find an explanation for it. And I have grave concerns as to how that park will now be used. And once you lease the public open space, then the person leasing that area is entitled to remove you from that open space. So a lot of people are now actually walking on land that they're not entitled to walk on. Why is there such a large area of land leased with the hall? Well, part of the reason for that is that, that the lessee is responsible for the maintenance of that area of land, but I must also point out that that lease doesn't exclude public access. And one of the things that the lessee is required to do is to allow free public access through that leased area and particularly the grounds around Athol Hall. But this has already been breached. It's already been breached and that breach has been taken up with the lessee. I mean, we, we're all subject to various laws of the land and those laws get breached by some of us from time to time and, uh, and we get pulled back into line and that's what we've done with the lessee here. If the matter arises again, then we'll, we may well have to take action with, uh, against the lessee under the conditions of the lease. So what do you feel about all this new entrepreneurial activity on public land? Well, the question it begs is where does it all stop? And what is the function of government in relation to open space? If open, passive and active recreation space isn't provided by government, who's going to provide it? And if all budgetary problems are answered by leasing out open space, it definitely won't stop. If this is the new culture and this is the new trend, it's far too easy solution for any government, federal, state or local, and thereby the community will end up completely alienated with no public space. Mossman is a comfortable, affluent suburb, an unlikely place for a grassroots movement to protect public land from private development. Yet it's here that developers have clashed with conservationists and the council with its own ratepayers. They've been arguing for almost 10 years. It's all over this building, the Balmoral Bathers Pavilion. I think you've got to see that building from the water. 
to appreciate um, the feeling that a lot of people have for that building. To me, the Moorish architecture gives this wonderful feeling of expectation of something fabulous. It is a beautiful building and it has that fantastic feeling of something oriental, something exciting. Even though the judge and might have come down for a month, our guys... Don Seaton is once again taking the Mossman Council to court. To many people, he speaks for the public conscience. To the council, he's a problem that won't go away. This is the fourth round, and I hope it's the winning one. I first got involved, uh, it would have been middle 93. Uh, it was about the time I was retiring. I uh, had been fairly selfish all my life, working hard for my own gain, and I thought it was about time I, I put a little bit back and uh, see what I could do. To me, um, community land is, is sacred. Why not try to attend the court hearing, the appeal court today at 10.15? I can't. No, okay. okay. But well, I'll give you a transcript. If you give me your name, I'm certainly... I'm not interested, Mr. Seaton. Thank you. Oh, there we are. And I think you've had your chance. Okay, and I think it, the council and the community has been very fair to your views. And now I think you should let, okay. let the okay. municipality you, get on with okay. its business but and not you, be Do you realise that 75% of Mossman residents and 90% of North Sydney residents are against that development? Another support. Uh, David, David, you, you hang on to that. that that's, that's our suggestion of how the Western Forecourt will look under the council's plan. And that is a fact. Taking legal action against council was only at the last resort, but on each occasion when we were threatening to go to court, we advised council that we'd withdraw any legal action provided they held a referenda, which would be paid for by myself each time they refused. So we had no alternative but to again take them to court. It's hard to believe that Balmoral Beach and other popular spots around the harbour were once private property. It takes a royal commission in 1909 to resume harbour land and dedicate it forever to public recreation. Trams and cars bring thousands of visitors and in 1928, the Bathers Pavilion is built to cater to their needs. In the 1980s, it houses a restaurant and when the lease is sold, the new tenant seeks major changes. A privately operated 21-room hotel, a conference and exhibition center, a larger restaurant and a car park for 30 vehicles on adjoining public parkland. Under this proposal, the Bathers Pavilion will be completely transformed. In 1989, the developer, Victoria Alexander, lodges her plans with Mossman Council. I am passionate about it. If, and I'm sure you have, Peter, as many other people have, have stayed in small hotels or little owner-managed places on trips overseas or even in the country in Australia, and they become part of your memory. They become more than a night somewhere, something special, something touches you. She wanted to put a small hotel. Well, you know, this was just totally wacky, you know. No, it was going to be a boutique hotel. Connie Seavers, a local resident, is among the first to object. She makes it her business to find out just what is allowable on public land. It was found that the hotel development was a prohibited use. But from 1989 to 1994, the council tried in every way possible to circumvent the restrictions that applied to that land. The restaurant is now, you know, world famous, world famous. People come to Balmoral to go to that restaurant. We have an excellent lessee there who I believe has come up with the best possible solution for the restoration of the building. And you've got to look at that. But this bit back here, the subdivision's never been finished off. If I remember rightly, I think I got involved in September 1992. 
we formed a, a group called the Balmoral Beach Preservation Society. The Balmoral Beach Preservation Society suddenly took on a life of its own and all sorts of people seemed to have heard of us. Didn't matter which government department we went to, nobody ever knew it was only two people. <laughs> and, and, you know, after a while you begin to realise that everything isn't as it ought to be when people fight so hard to stop you seeing information that should be in the public arena. So we decided as total amateurs to call a public meeting and uh, much to my surprise on 10 days notice we got about 500 people up to the town hall on a Sunday at lunchtime and with eight exceptions everybody was against the pavilion development so we realised that we had a very strong backing and the people that were at that meeting weren't you know bomb throwing radicals it was a sort of twin set and pearl brigade of Clifton Gardens and after that we had a 7.30 report. Victoria Alexander engaged a top architect to interpret her ideas. But none of it meant a thing if the developer and Mossman Council couldn't find a way around the section of the Local Government Act which prohibits private development on public land. The Mossman Council and the developer have tried to wrest control of the building from the people. But the Council's legal manoeuvring is exposed nationally in 1993. It had engaged prominent QCs to find a way around the restrictive uses of public land. The solution they devised was to obtain a permanent conservation order over the building, not to conserve it, but to give control of the pavilion to the Minister for Planning, who could then use his powers under the Heritage Act to override the restrictions on the land. Seen by many as a cynical device, the conservation order meant that the major redevelopment could now go ahead. But the state government demands an independent conservation report. This report, recommending that any future use of the pavilion be open to public expressions of interest, is adopted by Mossman Council. Time after time, Mossman Council would make a decision and they would approve something at one meeting and the next meeting it would be unapproved. Now right back in 1992, I remember David Strange making a, um, moving a motion that the whole matter be deferred and the course of the lease be allowed to run. And that was approved on a Tuesday night and I was there. I was there two nights later at the next meeting where the whole thing was rescinded. I was at a council meeting where, on the general manager's recommendation, that the matter should be put out to public tender. The next council meeting, that was rescinded, and, well, actually it wasn't even rescinded. A motion, a contrary motion was passed that poor Victoria be given an opportunity to put in a new submission, a new development application. But in the end, I don't think it has anything to do with even so much Victoria Alexander. I think it has to do with the fact that people have gone down one, one road and they believe that they stand to lose face if they back down. And so in the end, it becomes an issue of naked power. Who are these two little old ladies who are going to tell us what to do? We hold the power, we don't have to answer to them, we don't have to answer to anybody, and we will move heaven and earth to protect our Ballywick. With the hotel proposal blocked as an illegal use of public land, the developer amends her plans to now include a greatly expanded restaurant, a conference center, exhibition room and offices. Almost all of the pavilion would be placed in private hands for 21 years. Mossman Council never considers alternative proposals put to it, nor calls for public expressions of interest. We put up a proposal which we gave the council a copy of in which we showed that if they had a restaurant the size that the operation was at the time, 120 seats, and if they had a coffee shop, which would be a community-style coffee shop, which would operate, uh, operate on a quarter of the ground floor, and if they had a kiosk with supervised change rooms, they could in fact bring in considerably more than the proposition that, had been, that they'd been considering and nobody wanted to know about it. I think its use uh, as a restaurant is appropriate, uh, as a coffee shop is appropriate, as changing rooms for the public is appropriate. 
So, you know, the principle of 50% community, 50% commercial is probably a fair one. It's one that the Pavilion for the People have pushed and supported, but the Council have not accepted that. And why do you think that is? Oh, I, I think uh, they have been committed from day one to this particular tenant's agenda. And I don't know why. Uh, one day we might find out. What's at stake is that you've got land that's owned by the people and yet they don't have any access to it. It doesn't really concern me how much of it is open to the public at the present time. My feeling from what I know is that basically none of it is open to the public at the present time except for the couple of uh, toilet blocks and that's not even in the building that's around the corner. So do you feel that the council isn't listening to the wishes of the people? Oh, I'm certain of that in the, in the case of the Balmoral Bathers. I don't think they, the, the councillors realise how many people are against what Victoria Alexander has got. When they get about 2,000 submissions against the development, which is a public building on public land, you'd think that they would listen to the people. Yeah, I think it's great. I love the Bathers Pavilion. I'm really proud that we've got such an excellent restaurant there, world class. And it'd be nice if they could put just a cafe on another half so that everyone can afford to enjoy the Bathers Pavilion. I'm in favour of it being okay, redeveloped and um, because it is well managed and it's a good facility to have here. It, it um, brings a lot of people you know, to the area for eating. Council have been quite reluctant to, to we believe, to give any adequate explanation. Now we must then quickly say we don't belong to any one of, there are several formal groups, you know, friends of the pavilion, or and enemies of the pavilion and so on. We don't belong to any of those, we are ratepayers, we live here and we do feel having taken, um, you know, more than a passing interest that, that really the process uh, mm. has never been adequately explained and, and, and therefore, it, and it's probably quite wrong, people make all sorts of assumptions that there has to be something underhand. I'm not saying that I believe that, but I've had people say, you know, who's getting what? Well, Mosman Council um, put out the message that they've consulted the people of Mosman, and they appear to have consulted the people of Mosman, but in fact they haven't. And uh, they don't listen to the vast majority of people, they listen to the people whose voices they want to hear, who say the things they want to hear. The consultation process is has been extensive, but, uh, but unfortunately the, the, it's a problem in the way the consultation was done because the consultation has always been get the application in from the lessee, the council is saying, well, this is what wants to be done, what do you think of this? Whereas the way the consultation process should have run is that the, the, the council should have taken leadership and said, we're thinking of doing something with this building, these are the various options, what do you think? You know, Mossman Council um, has been the champion of competitive tendering. And we've done it on all the parts of the departments, in outside staff and things like that. We've got, put it all out to tender. And yet this is one of the most major things the council's ever had to do. And it hasn't been put out to tender. That's the one thing that I really object to. Mossman Council made the decision, rightly or wrongly, but they made the decision, which I, I believe was in their, uh, uh, in its um, uh, area of responsibility, uh, that the uh, the best deal it could get was uh, with the existing um, lessee, and uh, I was prepared to accept it. Even though tenders were not called? Mm. Even though tenders were not called, yes. And you're not worried about that? Well, it's, uh, as I say, that, that was a real situation. I think if council had gone to public tender, it actually would have resolved a huge amount of angst and it would have answered an enormous number of questions. Because the more you went to public tender, public tender makes the council think clearly. To actually put out a tender document, it makes the council think clearly exactly what they want for the use of that building. They then put out and all the other ideas come in that they haven't thought of. If it goes out to public tender, then everybody's had their chance. And the winner wins, and the losers lose. It's, that's, that's life. Well, I have to be. Here's Richard. Hello, Richard. Oh, good. good on you. Hello, good on. Richard. Come, come and join us. <laughs> <laughs> the legal challenge by the Mossman Parks and Bushland Association and the Pavilion for the People Group is about to be decided. 
Among their concerns is a long period of the lease. The length of the lease is, is just unbelievable. I don't know of anybody who gets 21 year leases. You don't get it from the Maritime Services Board, you don't get it from anyone. And yet one person gets a 21 year lease. Miss Alexander is expending a lot of money on the internal fit out. She needs at least that period of time to recoup her financial input. Because you can hardly construe that a building that's been uh, leased out for 21 years to one person, 97% use of the building for 21 years, it's a de facto sale of the building, it's been sold. A lot of the building, of course, isn't required for the restaurant. In order to run a 250-seat restaurant, you only need about 700 square metres of area. And we're giving them 1,916 square metres of area, which is equivalent to five tennis courts of area to run a restaurant for 250 people. There is another shock for the residents of Mossman. Initially, the cost of renovating the exterior of the building was to be met by the developer in return for reduced rent. Mossman Council, however, now votes to meet this cost from its own revenues, but the vote is deadlocked. When the mayor of Mossman uses her deciding vote to commit ratepayers to funding the renovations, the result is public outrage. Ladies and gentlemen, can you all hear me? I'd like to introduce you to Malcolm Ritchie and Peter Burke, who are currently taking our banners down from the front of the pavilion here, because they claim that we have no right to put a banner on your pavilion. What do you think of that? What do you think of that? What do you think of that? Well, that is exactly how this whole matter on the pavilion has been handled for day one. And whenever, when anybody has said anything against the entrenched plan, these blokes have carried on exactly this way. What's wrong with a little banner? Is there anything wrong? L ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of you people have been fed a lot of lies. And I am here, and I am here Go home, straight. Malcolm. Go home, Malcolm. So in other words, all you people are interested in is your own load of bullshit. In 1996, local businessman John Partridge makes a series of counter-offers to the council. He offers to pay for all renovations, open up more of the building to public access and return $4 million more to ratepayers over the term of the lease. The council refuses to meet with him. I firmly believe the councils had bunkered themselves in a position where they could not retreat. Uh, somewhere along the line, um, it is